Hey everybody, uh, we'll get on YouTube and Zoom. We'll get here started in about 60 seconds. Um, very happy to have you and um, Kevin McLaughlin on the webinar today. Hi Dave, nice to be here. Hey Thank Kevin. You. So uh, give it a, a maybe uh, 20 seconds and we'll get we'll get going. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, Kevin, you ready? Ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. Uh, we're back at, back at it again for another great week of free webinars, and we're excited to have my boss um, and assistant director of hockey development uh, for USA Hockey, Kevin McLaughlin. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I want to say thanks to everybody that has been following the coach webinar series. And I want to say thank you personally to you for all the work that you've done to, uh, to produce these and facilitate um, what's been, uh, I think, I think nine weeks, or is this the 10th week of, uh, of some great webinars, some, some great guests that you've had? I, I think this is week nine. I th week think nine? Week, yeah, I think so. I have to do the math. Yeah. So, uh, Ohio State, we didn't really do much math there. So just kidding. But I uh, just want to I want to get started here. And, you know, uh, grew up in Texas, but uh, lived in Chicago, kind of been around the U.S., went to Miami of Ohio. Um, but how did you get started within USA Hockey? So um, after I graduated uh, college, I moved down to Houston, Texas, and uh, was volunteering with the Youth Hockey Association down there, uh, just kind of giving back to to uh, the game that I uh, you know, felt gave me so much and so much opportunity. And obviously at the time there uh, weren't a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of hockey or a lot of rinks going on in Houston. So I started volunteering. I became like a, a volunteer coaching director. Um, I moved from there to San Diego. Um, I got involved in youth hockey out there, just, just giving back to the game. And then um, I took a job with Procter and Gamble and actually moved to Seattle and uh, really got heavily involved in the youth hockey program up there. Uh, they, they had a great program, Snow King Amateur Hockey. Um, I met some outstanding people. Uh, they had a pretty unique youth program up there. And um, one thing led to another, and I be ended up becoming their, um, their hockey director after coaching in their club for a few years and coaching uh, everything from the 18U midget team and going to uh, national championships and coaching in the max tournament and a lot of great experience coached um, 12 U peewee hockey coached in the Quebec peewee tournament. Um, so we ran a, um, uh, one of the original initiation programs. We started an inline league out there as part of our recruitment for uh, new kids to come and play hockey. And then I got involved in, uh, in Panaha, which is the affiliate up there and, uh, and also the Pacific district with their player development. Uh, and volunteering um, as, a, as a coach education program volunteer out there. Um, started working the national player development camps as a coach. Uh, met Doug Palazzari and a few other people. And one thing led to another. USA Hockey had a job posting. And um, I got a phone call from a buddy of mine, that Mark Tabram, that was uh, coaching at Colorado College at the time. And he said, did you see the job that USA Hockey has posted? And I said, yeah, but, I, you know, I don't know. If, uh, if that move, you know, if it's the right fit, but uh, I talked to Brian Petrovic and some other people at USA Hockey, and um, that was 1997, January 1st, 1997, uh, I moved to Colorado Springs, and it's been an awesome, uh, an awesome experience, and continue to learn every day. It's an unbelievable organization, uh, the depth of the, of the volunteers, the depth of the, of the staff, the commitment and the passion for, uh, for, for the game of hockey and just the love of the sport just uh, is unique. You know, I've, like I said, I had real jobs before coming to work in at USA hockey. And this is, um, this is a passion and seven days a week, you get to do what, uh, what you love and work with people that, uh, that share that passion. So it's been great. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and then starting in 2000, you're actually uh, part of the, uh, International Ice Hockey Federation Development Committee since 2003, but you were uh, part of the Learn to Play program instructor. 
you know, as part of the International Ice Hockey Federation, um, if people are not aware, it's um, that essentially the international governing body would be probably the easy way to put in. You know, you presented a, a many different world championships at the coaching clinic. So, you know, with big, big high name coaches, big people in lots of high positions within with throughout the world. How was your how's your time with the IIHF? It's uh, it's been it's been awesome. It's I've met unbelievable people. Um, very humbling experience for me actually to be you know was one of the speakers with uh, some of those elite coaches and some of those elite uh, ex players and you know names in hockey. But um, my passion and I think where I connected with the IHF is is helping focus on the grassroots side of thing and helping to grow um, the base for so many countries. Um, that are trying to start hockey, trying to build hockey, and trying to start a coach education program, an officiating program, a recruitment program. Um, you know, most countries that are members of the IHF are non-traditional hockey markets, really. Um, and so the, the idea to grow the game worldwide, the idea to grow grassroots hockey, grow coaching education, coaching development uh, is a real passion of mine. And I think it, um, the IHF, kind of went through a transition. And then we were able to build some momentum with the, uh, the coaching uh, committee in the, uh, in the development committee. And we started a learn to play program, which is essentially 12 and under hockey, everything from recruitment to uh, up through 12 years old and implementing and, and, and kind of coaching other nations and federations on recruitment programs, grassroots programs, but also implementing uh, long-term athlete development, long-term player development. So that they're more sustainable and more competitive at the at the older age groups. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, and um, do just being with some of those countries that are not your typical hockey markets. You know, and you know the the gratitude that they always bring of you know just little little things to that they can take back is really you know gratifying. I, I think that's a, a big part. Um, they they remind me a lot of uh, some of our non traditional states. You know, we have a, they're very similar to that. So um, the connection with a, with a Texas or an Arizona or a Florida or, you know, South Carolina or some non, what people think are non-traditional places, but people that are, that are involved in hockey in those places, whether it's a state or one of those other countries, they love hockey as much as anybody does. And a lot of times um, they, they work so hard to grow our game and to make, make our game enjoyable for the kids and the families that do it. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's very gratifying to work with, with our non-traditional areas, I think. And, and you've seen the growth and the opportunity, the population that, that those places present. Um, there's nowhere to go but up. And, and they can, make, they can uh, make ground really fast, you know, whether, and we've seen it. And then it, What's been really uh, rewarding also is to see that the, the bonds we've built and the relationships we've built with, um, you know, other countries like hockey, traditional countries. So Sweden, Finland, Czech Republic, Switzerland, Slovakia, um, we've really created some momentum, I think, to focus on um, youth hockey and building that base and, and building uh, proper sports science into that that base of youth hockey and coach development and uh, it's it's phenomenal to see and they've helped us a lot and hopefully we've been able to uh, to provide some support to them too yeah and, and just like by doing these webinars you actually see a lot a couple of those countries on here and people that we know over watching throughout the last you know eight nine ten weeks or so so it's really cool and to stay up to date you know they're doing some great things but we're also trying to you know utilize some of our sports science and you know you were talking about the non-traditional markets and you know it all comes down to programming and you know and we want to bring a world-class program to each each um association and you know provide that product for our our, our members um and i know you have a little kind of slideshow that you're going to pull up and you know maybe you can start start from there sure would be great and uh, if you have any questions, just throw them in the Q and A, and we'll try to get them uh, on both Zoom and and YouTube. But um, we'll we'll try our best to to get those answered. You're okay. So as uh, as this discussion today is is called uh, setting the stage for world class programming, and it's really what we're trying to do here at USA Hockey. And 
Um, hopefully, um, we've learned some things and can share some things with our local associations. And whether you're a, a parent, whether you're a coach of an individual team, whether you're a hockey director, or even a, a, a have a leadership position on a board, a local youth hockey board, hopefully uh, some of the, the things we talk about here today uh, can assist you and we can, you know, kind of let you know the resources that are available and uh, some of the people that are here to support you and your association. Um, also in the coming weeks, you know, we're gonna dive deeper into these topics. Um, for instance, next week, uh, we're gonna have a, a discussion about how to grow your membership. And obviously the situation we're in right now um, with, with um, so many of the ice rinks across the country being shut down, I do know that the kids, um, kids across the country are just climbing the walls to get back out and be physically active. I'm sure mom and dad are you know, excited to get them back out physically active, socializing with their friends. So we're gonna have a little discussion next week with Katie Holmgren about how to grow membership and, um, and, and some examples of uh, some exemplary clubs around the country that have done that. Um, the following week, we'll talk about world-class coach developer programming with Mark Tabram and, and Mike McMillan. Uh, we'll go through some of those resources today and just kind of um, uh, make you aware of them if you're not already. Um, and then our annual Congress is coming up in a couple of weeks and we'll have the opportunity to, to talk with our vice president of uh, youth council, Keith Barrett, and also um, some affiliate representatives uh, to talk about, to take a look under the hood at USA Hockey a little bit more in depth than maybe most people are familiar with and talk about what resources your affiliates and districts provide, how your coaching chiefs um, uh, can provide some service if you don't already know about that, uh, your ADM regional managers, our growth department representatives, uh, coach development and player development stuff that's available to everybody through affiliates and districts. Um, after that, we'll talk about creating a world-class culture in your program uh, with with Dan Jablonic, one of our regional managers, he'll talk to a couple of club hockey or a couple of hockey directors from different clubs across the country that really bring a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and have seen their programs flourish both from a competitive level and a growth level. Uh, talk about creating that club culture, and then uh, the following week we'll dive into a little bit deeper into individual club culture and what it means to deliver world-class in-season programming. And we'll take a deep dive look at one age group, one team, and one what, what uh, one team did this last year to kind of show people, we use the term simple, not easy. And, um, you know, there's a lot to be done. Most coaches are volunteers, but I think we all agree that our kids deserve the best that we can give them. And there's a, with all the resources, maybe if we share that responsibility between coaches, between hockey directors, between parents on a team, we can see how, how much we can give to these kids because as we say, you know, a 10 year old is only a 10 year old once, a 12 year old is only a 12 year old once. So how can we best serve them so that they can enjoy the game to the max and, and fulfill their genetic potential if that's actually a dream of theirs. So to get going with this one here today, we're gonna, what got us kind of woke us up back in, um, in, in about 2007, is we noticed that our eight and under numbers had been declining um, since 2000. So, and that 20% of those new players that signed up dropped out after the first season. So obviously that's not good. Um, something's going on there. 43% of all of our eight and under players dropped out by the time they were nine years old. And 60% of the kids were leaving the game before they turned 11 years old. So obviously that, that was alarming. At the same time in 2007, the U.S. was ranked on the international stage and the world rankings as seventh. So we, we were behind Slovakia at number six, Russia at five, and Czech Republic at four, Finland at three. And obviously with, uh, with the number of people, the number of ice rinks that we have, we thought looking in the mirror that we needed to do a better job and, and get a little bit more laser focused and, uh, and pay attention to what we were doing and improve our, improve our efforts. So in 2007, Ken Martell and I went to uh, Calgary to, uh, or we went to a USOC conference here in Colorado Springs actually. We met a gentleman by the name of Isvan Baye. 
quite frankly, it was the first time we had heard about long-term athlete development and some of those uh, principles behind that. He invited us to go to uh, Calgary to attend a long-term athlete development summit. And there we met Steve Norris. And uh, Steve was, both of those guys were guiding lights for, for Ken and I. And um, uh, they held our hand basically through this um, analyzing how long-term athlete development principles, how we could apply those to our youth hockey program and our model that, we, that could help us move the ball forward a little bit and be better. Uh, in 2008, um, we finalized what we termed the American Development Model Plan, and we created our membership development department because we realized that there was really no one, no department here at USA Hockey that was focused solely on recruiting and that, that next generation of hockey players. In 2009, we submitted, a, or at the end of 2008, we submitted our plan to the National Hockey League. And in 2009, we received the NHL endorsement and uh, support, financial support, which allowed us to start hiring regional managers. And um, that was kind of the, 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 uh, the birth of our development plan and our development model. Um, and we were able to get off the ground and going and get something organized and have a plan actually moving forward. So from there, we've, we've become, hold on a sec. So what's important to us now as a result of all of that is we've become laser focused on our recruitment efforts. We've become um, very focused on age appropriate, age specific programming. We've become more aware of the need for coach development. And we've even as recently as this last year and a half been very focused on updating and upgrading our, our coach development process and our coach education program. And I think when, um, based on the pilots that we've seen, and I know Mark and, and Mike McMillan will talk about this next in, in a couple of weeks, but I think it's gonna be an outstanding experience for those volunteer coaches that go to those coaching clinics, more interactive, more participant um, oriented and, uh, and very applicable to the day-to-day -day job of a, of a coach. Uh, and then we've, we've also focused on more parent information and trying to explain to parents what, what are, what's behind our recommendations, what the recommendations are for their child. We have age-specific age newsletters that we send um, so if I have an eight-year-old, I'm going to get the eight and under newsletter from USA Hockey. If I have a 12-year-old, I'll get a 12-view 12 12 newsletter. So trying to keep people up to date um, so that they know what to look for when they go to the rink and they, and they watch their kids' practices um, and to be, try to be very athlete-centered with all of these things, with our programming, with our coach development and our parent information to make sure we're 100% focused on the needs and what best serves each individual uh, youth player. So what is, what is player development? That's, uh, that's one of those questions that if you ask, if you ask uh, probably 20 youth hockey coaches or parents, you're gonna get 20 different answers. And it can get either really, really complicated and sports science-y and um, drill down, or we can try to deliver the message at a, um, a layman's level so that uh, people like me that don't have a sports science background, we can understand it and we can go to the rink and, uh, and as, as a youth hockey coach and deliver what's, what's, a, what's best for, uh, for our team that we're coaching. So, this is a, a, a graph put together by Joe Bon at one of our ADM regional managers. And I think it really exemplifies what the message is for all of us is this player development is a massive mound of information and can be overwhelming, quite honestly, if you sit down and try to, to read the book from start to finish and really implement everything you're doing. But I think the key takeaway here is we have to understand what age group we're coaching. We have to understand that that age group is unique. And we have to understand and, and prioritize and that the number one thing we can, we can bring to the rink is to understand we're there to serve. We're there to serve that age group, that team, that group, that year. And we have to make that year 
the best that it can possibly be. And so what do we know about that, that age group and what can we bring to it to, uh, to deliver the hockey development side? So key pro some key um, development programming components for our USA Hockey recommendations. And as I think most people know, um, the American development model is our player development model from beginner to uh, adult league recreational stuff and everything in between, including our uh, national teams, our uh, girls programs, boys programs, uh, and everything in between. So first and foremost, it's age appropriate training. Second, it's efficient practice plans. One thing as a hockey director that I learned right out of the shoot is we better have a practice plan. And quite frankly, I plead guilty to this. I show up at the rink with a practice plan and I pretty much deviate at least one part of practice every single time based on how it's going. But I think in order for us to maximize development and be organized is we have to have a plan stepping on the ice. What does our team need? Where, where are we in the season? And what, is, what are we gonna try to do? And I need to communicate that with my other coaches prior to even coming to the rink. Um, the team I coach with right now is a high school team with a couple of other USA Hockey staffers, Kenny Martell and, and Kristen Wright, along with a, um, a teacher from the school. And we, we share that email uh, with the practice plan prior to going to the rink. Um, we make assignments, who's going to run which, which game or which drill or what part of practice. Um, and so we're organized. At, and then afterwards, we do a little download, a little feedback session. How did it go? Was it good? Was it bad? Should we do that again? Should we not do that again? So you have a record and something that you can build off of. Off ice training. I think I see this as I travel around the world as one of the weaknesses in our, uh, in our culture, quite honestly. There are um, uh, opportunities for us to get better there. And I think um, uh, implementing more off ice training and making a standard of, of every one of our trips to the rink and we'll see great results and great return on our player development with those guys. Um, body checking. Body checking has been a big point of emphasis for a couple of years now. We've created some resources. Um, we'd like to start seeing that body contact, body checking being taught off ice and on ice, all the way down to the eight and under. Um, you, can start, you can start the basics and we'll walk through some of that stuff here uh, a little later in this presentation in this discussion. But there's a lot of resources there and we need to build that up all the way, even before full body checking is allowed at the 13 year and 14 year old age group. And then goaltending, goaltending has become a priority of ours. Obviously, um, goaltending might be the most important position. I wanna be a little bit conservative with my accolades and my, and my um, kudos to the goaltending group here. Cause I know David, you're part of Goalie Nation. I know your buddies are probably watching and probably uh, sending you individual texts to ask questions about how goaltending fits into this. But um, uh, goaltending is a number one priority. The funny thing is, is when I started here, Coach Dave Peterson across the hall from me says, you know how to win more medals? I said, how is that, sir? He says, get off the bus with the best goalie. So obviously it's, uh, it is important. It's a, it's a priority for us. And Steve Thompson's doing a great job with the help of Dave Caruso and, and Brent Seidel uh, developing goaltending resources and a goaltending structure to deliver those programs um, across the country. So Kevin, I just want to touch on um, that slide that you had. All that stuff is on our website, usahockey.com. And you know, there's different sections. The off-ice training has, a, and you're going to touch on it, has um, usahockey.com slash dryland. We have body checking, we have a manual, and then the goaltending is being, you know, we have a weekly webinar. So um, all that stuff is hopefully we have resources for our coaches and that we provide. Um, so it's there. And um, just want to just touch base and just tell the, the crowd. No, great point. Great point. All of this stuff is uh, is available on the website, um, and we'll we'll talk uh, near the end here with about the resources and where you can find them. So one question that we that we all often ask is, uh, uh, do we do you think or do you know? And um, so we said on average. A fully developed NHL player occurs at what age? And this is just a point to reiterate um, the long-term athlete development. 
and what is actually normal versus the early matures that we see so frequently. So we asked this question of Dean Lombardi and lo and behold, here's his comment. You think you're crazy if you think 18 year olds are even near their maturation. They're not fully developed until they're 26 years old. So that's an NHLer, right? And if we're very focused on developing people, but we make, unfortunately in our youth hockey culture, all too often we see people making decisions on players, whether they're good or not good enough at sometimes at nine years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, 14 years old. And this is a marathon. If there's ever a marathon, this is a marathon to become an elite player. So this is kind of the spine and the backbone of our long-term athlete development. These are, these are LTAD stages. Uh, this has been endorsed by the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee, the National Hockey League, and you can see, and as David said, there's more details, and each of these has a fully built-out uh, stage document uh, on admkids.com. Uh, but you can see here that sometimes we think, even at the 12U or 14, 16U, that we've been in hockey a long time, and we have pretty elite players, and that um, those guys are pretty far along in their pathway. But you can see it's only halfway, um, halfway there or training to win is that elite level of junior hockey or college hockey or NHL. So we, in our office here in, in the youth hockey department, we focus on uh, pretty much the first five and then we turn it over to those older ages. But the active start, the fundamentals and the learn to train are so critical because if you remember those those data points I mentioned before where kids were dropping out of hockey, we were losing 60% of our kids before they ever got to the train to train stage. So I think it's critical that we do a really good job and we acknowledge and we understand what those stages are uh, as, as our kids go through those. Not a great slide, I acknowledge that, but I put it up here because hopefully you've seen this in your rink. We send, this is a, a large poster that we've sent to every rink in America. And it kind of, it's, it's a Cliff Notes uh, scaled down version, but it talks about the details of, of each age group in each of these stages. It, it breaks it down by age, males and females. It breaks it down by recommended uh, number of practices per year, recommended number of games. And it talks about the priorities for that age group. There's another little um, uh, infographic that we've used. Uh, ADM, simple, not easy. But it this also breaks down the number of practices, the number of games, the number of off-ice sessions to give you a framework. It's not an exact science, but it does give you a framework. One of the frustrating parts uh, when I was a hockey director, when I was a youth hockey coach in Seattle, it was, you know, what should I be doing? What's the recommendation? What's best for these kids? Um, and unfortunately, I probably underserved some of them coming at it from a, an ex-college guy or a um, you know, a competitive 18U player um, and bringing that mindset and remembering those drills and how much we played or how much we practiced or what we did off ice and applying that to 8U, 10U, 12U, 14U. And that just wasn't appropriate. So now hopefully we've, we've uh, modernized and, and provided some resources now that weren't available so long ago. And, um, and we're kind of trying to make this easier for people to understand and build a season plan off of that and at least have some structure for your planning. So this next slide kind of reiterates, I think modern day coaching and our approach is are we preparing for the future game? Do we know what the future game is going to look like or are we coaching how the game looked when we played? And if we're coaching the way the game looked like when we played, we're probably underserving the needs of our players because the game is evolving. The game's evolving fast. I, uh, my youngest son graduated from college on Saturday. The commencement speaker was outstanding, I thought. He's one of the leading podcasters in the world. And he told a story about when he was in college that computers had just come out People didn't have laptops. There was no tablets. There was no cell phone. He was, a, he was a theater and a history major. 
And now he's one of the leading podcasters of the world in an industry that didn't exist when he graduated from college. To me, that just exemplified how fast the world moves and how fast it's evolving. And I th don't think we can overlook that hockey's doing the same thing. You know, if you look at the way the game is played, you know, at some of the elite defensemen in the league, um, you know, we, there's a term being thrown around positionless, pos positionless hockey. Um, we're not really satisfied with that term at this point, but it's five guys playing hockey together. And so what are we preparing our players for? When I grew up playing, it was the right winger. You stayed on your side of the ice and you didn't go over to the other side of the ice. You didn't pass the puck in front of your own net. If you were a defenseman on the breakout and you know, the game was very, very linear, very North South and that's evolving, right? That's evolving now. So how do we teach the game and how do we know what the game will look like in the future versus what it looked like when we played, what it looks like when we watch the National Hockey League or the Olympics now, and what will it look like uh, looking into the future? And how do we build practices in a development program that serves our players as they evolve and they move in that direction? So five elements of a good practice that we've come up with, and this is less technical, but more uh, philosophical, but I think if you think of these five elements, every time you de design a drill or a game or a situation in practice, um, keep these in the back of your mind and hopefully it, it, it will help serve as a valuable guide. So is it fun and engaging? The number one thing, whether players playing for recreational uh, love of the game or whether it has a passion to try to be a pro or anything in between, they're, they're going to play if they have fun and we can engage them. If we don't engage them at their level of what they perceive to be as fun and define as fun, we're gonna lose them. So we have to keep that priority number one. Lots of puck touches, okay? Lots of meaningful puck touches, quantity and quality of those puck touches. Because if you do, look at most statistics and most data, um, players have the puck in a game less than a minute on their stick. So in a 60 minute NHL game, most players have the puck on their stick less than a minute. Youth hockey games, very similar. Challenges the player. Does the drill or the game challenge the player? All right, does it challenge in a reasonable way or is it too hard or not challenging enough? And constant de decision-making. As we've uh, done these uh, webinars that Dave has hosted, Every single elite level coach, men's side, women's side, college, professional, junior, American Hockey League, they say one of the most important skills a player has is hockey IQ and decision-making ability. Okay, we, I think we went through a phase where we developed some highly skilled robotic hockey players that were good in predetermined skate around cones drills, and they look pretty and they look like players, but they couldn't make decisions. So we've really tried to focus on building into uh, these elements of constant decision making. Everything we do off ice, even off ice and on ice, should try to challenge, or at least we should consider challenging them. Is there a way in this drill or game that we can make it a, a, implement a decision that must be made? So not a predetermined outcome. And then the last one, obviously it looks something like the game. We all want to see the game, and if they can have those repetitions in practice that look something like the game and emulate the game, then when they get in the real game, that's going to be more familiar to them. Then uh, I stole this from Youth Fitness Guy, and I thought it really tells the story that kids learn more from doing than they do by us telling them. Um, I plead guilty for the first 15 years of my coaching. I was telling, telling, telling everything that they should do or shouldn't do. And really that's, I've learned since that that is not the best way that, that players can learn. And I was underserving them before. So hopefully we can be better at that. David. So uh, Kevin, and I, I have a quote or, you know, Stuart Armstrong was on the podcast and he talks about showing where, uh, helping show the players where to look, not telling them the answer or telling them the solution but showing them where to look, you know, that's your role as a coach 
and then let them, you know, I have a, a couple of young kids too. I can tell them all day not to jump off the thing, but you know, they still do, <laughs> you know, like, and they got to yep. learn. So it, it just is it, funny that, you know, that's a great slide and um, show them where to look, show them where, where it is. And you just, you point them in the right direction and you're their guide. You're their, their person to help. So it's like guided discovery, right? It's kind of like we have to envision ourselves as teachers, like school teachers. What does an elementary school teacher do? What does a middle school teacher do? What does a high school teacher do? You know, you, you present them with the problem, you guide them, you support them, but you let them, you let them investigate, you let them experience it. And then you, you're there to help them when they, when they may drift off a little bit. And as you say, tell them where to look. Yeah. And the funny thing is like, Stuart was great. Like he, he always talked about repeat the process of finding the solution, not repeat the solution, you know, within that. So, you know, how do, how can this player come up with the solution on their own on the process of finding that solution? Not just, Hey, this is a solution. This is how you, how you do it. So. And I think, I think it's a, a great point for us as coaches to digest I think it's extremely challenging as a coach when you're coaching 15 to 20 players that some figure it out and some it takes longer for them to figure it out. So as a coach, how do I fulfill that for every player on my team when they're all going at different paces and different rates? I think that's that's the fun part of a coach. It's a challenging part. And and how can I be better at helping my players through that learning process? And that's being need centered, right? Like need centered, player centered, where, you know, this player might need a little different and that's your role as a coach is to try to find those, those areas that you can help improve, whether it's yourself by guiding or maybe even having other players be your, you know, your other voice and other way of helping them. Like, and that's, that's pretty big too. You know, I know we've talked about having um, players help out with younger age groups, but within their own team, I think you can really, you know, lean on that, especially as they're getting older. Yeah. There, you know, we talk about player pathways and player development and play, you know, the, the maturation of a player. And um, I think one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is in, it was pointed out to us by some guests we had from Sweden. We were over at the rank, we're watching something and Joe Bonnet and I and Ken Martell and Kenny Roush were there and the coat we were, we were not impressed with the, something the coach was doing. And he reminded us that every coach has their own pathway as well. So we're all learning and we're all developing and, and figuring out how we can do this because there's no light switch. There's no textbook. There's it's, it's experience. It's trying to constantly study and trying to, to take um, from influencers like Stuart and other people how can we take that and we become better coaches and apply that when we go to the rink on Tuesday, when we go back to the rink on Thursday, how can we do that and do that for every player that we. And, yeah. That reflection piece is huge, you know, and having mentors and a lot of our webinar guests have said, Hey, uh, you know, maybe not on the, on the screen, but they said, Hey, I, I have these mentors, boom, 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 you know, like, and it's, I think that's an important part for our coaches and, you know, for us to get better and use those people to our advantage. Yeah, for sure. So small area games, it's um, small area games. One of those things that everybody in a coaching clinic is say, how many people do small area games and everybody in the room raises their hand. And then when we do breakouts and we start talking a little bit about it, we, we find out that there's more depth to what small area games mean and why do we run them and what are we trying to get from them? And again, you know, we need to make sure that the, the players are having fun. They're competitive, competing. I think competing is a, is a big um, part of the thread that runs through USA hockey and what we want from our, our elite players for sure. Um, it can enhance skill development, enhance problem solving in hockey IQ. And that's where Dave, I think you create that environment. You show them where to look, but you don't necessarily tell them how to solve it. So that's a big part of, of small area games is creating that game-like situation, that game-like environment, and you know maybe directing the player or giving hints to the player, creating the constraints that help that player learn where the solution is. The big yeah, one, and, four, the four games. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, and uh, you know it's you want to look at yourself as a um, a in 
uh, a place and an environment builder. You know, you're building, you're setting up the environment. You know, you're not just having coming up with a drill, you're setting up the environment where our, all our players can learn the best for this situation that they might be going through or these couple situations. Yeah. And the four game roles, this is one that we've really started to talk more about at our clinics and uh, in our coaching programs and in the discussions we have as a staff is the four game roles. So uh, on offense, it's offensive player with the puck, offensive player without the puck, defensive player, on the puck and defensive player away from the puck. And pretty much every small area game that we do, uh, you'll find that those, those roles uh, probably exist in most of those games. And then you can teach team play um, and your form of systems also. Big part of this is, is age appropriate, age appropriate with playing surface, age appropriate with equipment, whether that equipment means the net sizes as we see here, whether it means the size of a stick, whether it means the flex of a stick, uh, the size of um, goalie gear, um, what is age um, age appropriate for that player and how does it uh, serve their needs as a player? So obviously we've decided a long time ago that playing five on five full ice hockey is not game-like, it's not realistic. It doesn't represent the real game of hockey uh, for, for five to eight year olds. Uh, and we've even on one of our webinars, David, if you recall, the, the, the guys from the Swedish Federation, uh, they're going three on three and they're going smaller uh, playing environments all the way up to 12 years old in this coming year. So uh, there's a lot to that. A lot of analysis has gone on. I think on our website on ADM Kids, you'll find some research that was done from Charles University in Prague by our friend, Dr. Thomas Parrish um, on uh, different playing environments and what's, a, what's most appropriate um, for each age group. Um, and that's, I think that's critical to their development, critical to their success and critical to them having fun and actually having those puck touches and those opportunities to score goals and have success. Off ice training, I talked about, we should be doing that every time we come to the rink, whether it's a practice or a game. Um, and, and this is another topic where everybody I think will say, yes, we do off ice training, whether they hire somebody, whether they pay memberships at a gym, uh, or whatever they do, but we need to focus on fundamental movement skills, agility, balance, coordination, and those speed windows. Uh, obviously, there's strength and power, and there's hockey skills. So uh, if you're stick handling a wooden ball, yeah, I'm doing off ice training, but am I fulfilling all the needs of a player? Uh, am I doing somersaults? Am I doing cartwheels? Am I doing jumping jacks? Am I doing um, some strength and power things that we can easily do? And I'll show you an example of that of these uh, dry land training cards that we have. We have different age groups. We have the 6U and 8U cards, and then we have the 10U and the 12U cards as well. The cards on the front side um, have the, the diagram of whatever that exercise is. They're color coded. Uh, on the back side, it explains what it is. And I think with a little bit of guidance from the adults, whether it's the coach or a volunteer parent, um, I think that um, you, know, you can teach the kids how to use these cards themselves. I've heard stories during, um, during this COVID period where uh, people are at home and their kids are just grabbing the cards. Danny Jablonik, one of our, our colleagues, said his kids were grabbing the cards and, and doing the workouts themselves and having so much fun. So um, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential to, to implement this in a very easy way with your team. Off-ice body checking, we talked about uh, teaching body contact and body checking. You can see this is a recommendation. I sure wish we'd see more around the country with our youth hockey programs. Uh, you're starting to see more and more implement this, but this is just getting kids comfortable off the ice, uh, full equipment, uh, teaching the technique that's in the, our off ice body checking manual. Um, but put the kids through this stuff off ice, even starting, I think these kids here were nine and 10, all the way up to 11 years old, but teaching them and building that contact confidence so that um, when they do get back on the ice, you can do these same drills. They're a little less stable because they're on their skates, but they're more confident in using their body and they've had the opportunity to be uh, coached through it so that they have the experience, they felt um, the experience, they know how it feels, how to, where they should try to uh, uh, take that contact or initiate that contact with proper technique. 
And just want to jump in there, Kevin, both with the dry land and the off ice body checking, just so our viewers know, you know, we're going to have some other type um, things that you're going to be able to watch with, uh, we're working on a body checking thing that, you know, will be kind of part of a webinar and we got some good plans. So keep on the lookout for that. And same with our off ice training. And if you want to look more on the usahockey.com website, they have a bunch of those cards that you can download. Usually we give them free to all the coaches in coaching clinics. And then same with the off ice or body checking manual. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on usahockey.com slash declaration. Um, could be two good resources. And we'll, we'll link that after the show. Thanks. And this is a, a quote that we thought was very, very applicable to our development plan. It's called long-term athlete development for, for a reason, obviously. Um, let's don't forget what the NHL GM said about um, a fully mature, fully developed uh, professional player. Um, we have to focus and remember how old they are. Some things they're ready for, some things they're not ready for. And I think this graphic uh, really uh, symbolizes that some things are just not ready for, right? Like it would be fun, but uh, I mean, you might go drive a go-kart, check it out, learn how to drive a little bit, but obviously we don't want a 10 or 12 year old getting behind the wheel of a, of a real car on the road. So Dave talked about some, some of the resources and where all of these things can be found. Our mobile coach app um, has all these coaching tools, has plan builders where you can build your own practice plans has over 400, uh, 400 drills and games on there, has a whiteboard that you can use. Uh, to me, one of the most valuable pieces on here is the activity tracker. And the activity tracker, can, you can actually track your player um, during practice. You'll see how much skating time they actually have, how, much, uh, how many puck touches, how many passes they make, how many passes they receive, how many shots on goal that they have. And there's also a goalie activity tracker that's a great tool. Um, we encourage everybody, coaches, uh, maybe ask a parent or another coach that will analyze your practice and give you some feedback. See where you're, you know, where you might be heavy on some things, where you might be missing out on some things. I will guarantee you that uh, the first few times that you have your practice analyzed, you'll be shocked. You'll think the numbers are much higher than they really are. But I think it's a real wake up call for all of us. And it, and it really gives us gives us data in a very simplistic way to show us what, we're, what, what kind of experience the kids are really getting. Are they really getting to shoot the puck? Are they really getting to make passes and make plays? Are they really getting to have the puck on their stick for very long in practice? Are we standing around talking too much at a whiteboard? Um, are we telling them too much more than and taking away some of their experience to play? So great tool there. I encourage if you haven't looked at it, uh, I encourage you, and I'm, I know Mark and Mike McMillan will talk more about that, but I think uh, that is one of the, uh, the best tools that's been created and it's available and that mobile coaching uh, app is free for everybody, everybody's use. Talked about these dry land training cards. They're very simple to use, very easy, co color-coded. Uh, hopefully we'll see people using those more. These 10 and under practice planners, um, are these age-specific practice planners, they include uh, the long-term athlete development stage. They include some body contact or body checking information in there. They give some sample practice plans so that people can use them as guides. Uh, some goaltending information that are in those. Outstanding resources. Those are downloadable for free also. And I know some, uh, some coaching clinics uh, provide those to all their attendees as well in hard copy. Small area competitive uh, games books and the teaching concepts through small area games. Uh, two different books and manuals that are available for download online. Uh, I do believe we're working to consolidate those two books and actually have added uh, a number of new games to those. But uh, the small area competitive games is broken down by age groups, has some fun stuff, some competitive stuff um, for each age group. And then the other one is teaching habits and concepts. Um, through those small games, but uh, great resources to uh, give you some ideas to plant some seeds and let you know some of the resources that uh, other coaches uh, across the country have contributed to, to the USA Hockey materials. And the Checking the Right Way for Youth Hockey book um, is a great resource, great uh, manual, has some off-ice and on-ice drills for you. 
uh, breaks the technique down. It talks all the way from the foundational skills to uh, the full body checking with some great resources. These are all available also on, uh, on the Mobile Coach app as well. So what we're trying to do is establish a gold standard uh, across the country. Obviously, we want more people playing hockey. We want more people falling in love and having passion for uh, what we believe is the greatest sport on earth. We want to provide them with a great development experience that's fun, that's motivating. Uh, we want to provide our coaches with resources that they can use so that they have an enjoyable experience so that they're able to serve the players um, with some recommendations and some, some proven resources, some proven um, methods that, uh, that, that we've found out and that we've experienced and other people have shared with us. Uh, and our ultimate goal is to win gold medals at the Olympics. Um, I know that's not everybody's pathway. Um, most of us, you know, don't make it that far, but we love playing the game. We love competing. We love making new friends. We love playing the game. We love giving back as a coach, um, playing other adult hockey with our buddies uh, when we're done at the competitive level. But uh, hopefully these resources can, can help you have a, a gold medal experience at whatever level uh, that might be. This finally is our uh, is kind of my overarching theme for all of this. There's so much meat here. There's so much to do as a as a coach. Um, most of us have full time jobs, and then you race to the rink to try to coach your team. We fully understand it's it's uh, it's simple. It's not it's not real complex, right? It's not um, uh, it's it's not brain surgery or rocket science, as people like to say, but uh, simple, but it definitely is not easy. We fully acknowledge that. Um, but there's lots there, and there are a lot of people that are here to, to help and support and serve you. Um, our ADM regional managers across the country, if you don't know who they are, uh, visit admkids.com, and maybe Dave will provide those resources too on the, when it's rebroadcasted and, and archived. Uh, but if you don't know who they are, they work out in the field, they work with your clubs. All that has to happen is you reach out and you invite and, and request for our ADM manager to, to come and help. Uh, they can help over the phone. They can help with Zoom. They can help in person. They can come to your rink. They can talk to you, your coaches, your parents, your board, um, and they can help put, to, put a really good plan together to, uh, to serve you as a coach and also the player needs. So um, at the end of the day, uh, with all this development talk and all this programming and details, uh, it's time to get to the rink and have some fun. And as we like to say, create the carnival on ice to where it's the most fun experience on earth. Kevin, thank you. That was uh, really good and a lot of great little understanding of, you know, seeing what it's all about having the world-class programming. Um, just want to, we're coming up to our time, but just wanted to Leave you. You have anything you want to add or say before we we sign off? Um, but just for, for my end, all the stuff throughout the the webinar, we'll try to link it up on the YouTube channel so that you'll be able to click on wherever you know if it's ADM Kids or or whatever. Um, we're trying to help and provide that resource. So we'll try to get that up as fast as we can. But again, thanks, Kevin. Do you have anything? No, I don't. I think it, there's uh, upcoming. Uh, webinars are going to be great on knowing how to grow your membership. And I think at this point, you know, we're all really excited to get back to the rink after, uh, after the restrictions are, are lifted. And I just encourage everybody to, uh, to be safe, but, um, you know, get back to the rink as soon as you can for your physical health, for your social health, um, and bring a friend, you know, bring a friend to come and try hockey, uh, whether they're five years old, whether they're 10 years old, whether they're 15 years old. Uh, there are people that have fallen in love with the game at all different ages and um, coming out of this. I think, uh, I think there's going to be an opportunity for everybody to, to fall in love with the game. It might be a little different to start. We might not be into full, you know, full in season league play right out of the shoot. It might look more like practices and some small games and stuff like that, but um, take advantage of all these resources. We're definitely here to help and support you. And I uh, just want to say thanks to all the coaches and all the parents out there for everything you do, uh, because without, without you, uh, USA Hockey would not be able to serve the kids that are, that are part of the organization. Well said. 
Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll see everybody tomorrow, Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Have a great day.